So there's, there's lots to talk about between CPL and Ernst and & Young and all the wonderful things you do. But first of all, just two things struck me just uh, chatting with you there a few weeks ago. You were only one of three of your class of 50 in Longford who went to university. Indeed, yes. <laughs> Times have changed. Times have changed. I think Longford is one of the, probably one of the highest rates of uh, um, secondary students going to third level now. No. But like that was over 25 years ago, and that was, I think things have changed for the better, but that was still quite surprising that there was only three. And, and I suppose your daughter now would be in a completely different situation. Oh yeah, 90, I'd say 92, 93% of her class in school um, went to university. Um, I mean, I think it is great to see how things have changed. I think in fairness, um, there has been a huge emphasis put on um, third level education, the whole third level education sector also has been broadened and there are much more options between the Institute of Technologies and the mm -hmm. universities as well. And I also think too, I mean, the demands of employers have changed as well. So, you know, nowadays your degree is almost regarded a little bit like the Leaving Cert was in my day. Exactly. Thanks, Pat, for point, pointing out how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, the same, I'm the same vintage, and I think um, it's, it's more how young we are, isn't it? Um, so, uh, yeah, I just, can people hear us at the back, yeah? Okay, great. Um, the other thing then that struck me was um, you studied maths and economics in UCD, and um, considering the, the, the great career you've had, you had a, a few years of um, detours. I did indeed. Um, after I uh, did my degree in 84 and it was a really tough time actually to finish in college because there were very few jobs, uh, really high unemployment and all that and I really didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I took the scenic route for sure okay. for a while. And uh, let's just talk about that a bit. Yeah. Um, I suppose a lot of people, you know, with the best intentions of a plotted out career, do a little bit of meandering and detours. But I, I know you spoke about you spoke about that in the past that you learned from those detours, yeah, and that stood to you later, yeah. Yeah, I think it did. I mean, it. it um, I did. I learned a lot from those. I suppose they, those, you know, that's probably what uh, helped form a character in a lot of ways, um, and um, you know, it probably helped me figure out. But I had a lot of support too, uh, good friends, you know, um, uh, good support from family as well. Um, and I suppose I would say uh, they kept encouraging me to kind of uh, get into something reliable and okay. uh, steady where I could make an income okay. or whatever. And eventually it came around. But, you know, I would I actually believe that once, you know, I have a daughter now um, who's 21 and she's in college. And, you know, I quite frequently talk to students about, you know, their hopes and aspirations. Uh, and I think as long as you do the best at whatever you're doing, in that given moment that you're doing it, that actually there's very little you can do wrong. So, you know, I look at a 21, 22 year old, even I was, you know, 24, 25 by the time I started to work, there's very little you can do wrong when you're in your early 20s as long as you have a reasonable focus, you're doing your best at whatever it is you're doing. Exactly, exactly. So, what got you into the recruitment business then after the couple of years of various jobs? <laughs> it was totally by accident. I, um, uh, so, I, my first job was in telesales, so I eventually got a job in telesales working with Xerox and um, I actually found I really liked sales and w w great company to work in and that phenomenal training and very quickly, of course I was only there a couple of months when I wanted to be out on the road, so eventually we, I got promoted to go out and, uh, on the road selling and um, eventually then I just, you know, decided it was time to move on to something else and I registered with a recruitment company to change jobs and in the interview they asked me would I be interested in recruitment. What's to impress them? I don't know about that but I said you know yeah well you know I thought it was really interesting but yeah. I said I don't really have the, I don't have the skill set for, for this so they said well look you know we'll train you um, and uh, the person who was interviewing me or organized for me to have an interview with the director and I was offered the job Great. when I got started. Great. Yeah, so it was good. And then 
after a while working there, you got, um, did you get sort of interested in well, set, going up on your own? Or how you know, that? I was so lucky because actually I really loved it. Just, um, I just loved recruitment. I, you know, very quickly came to the realization that your career is right up there with your health, wealth and happiness. You know, such a fundamental part of a person's life, what we do all day. And um, I, f I also found that I had a real affinity uh, with technology people. And of course, the technology industry in Ireland at that stage was very small. And um, the, but the way recruitment worked then was that you recruited for all types of different jobs. Nobody specialized. Um, and I really felt that I could, you know, that in order to be really a trusted advisor, uh, to both the people I was placing in jobs, but also to my customers, that I needed to specialise and build a really, really deep knowledge in the sec in my preferred sector, and that was the tech sector. So um, that's you know I went then to my boss and I asked him eventually could I specialise in the technology side of things, and he didn't. He, said, he didn't get it. That's not how we do things here. Okay. So, um, <laughs> the, okay. you know, so I continued for a while. In fact. I was, so I continued working there for a while, but eventually I was complaining a lot to uh, my husband, well, to Paul, who I was going out with at the time. And he basically said to me, look, Anne, eventually said to me, look, Anne, you have three options here. He said, um, or you have a number of options. He said, one of them is, um, some of them are good, but um, not all of them are. And he said, here are your options. He said, you can go to your boss, try and influence him to let you do things your way. Uh, he said, if that doesn't work, you can just forget about all the negative things and all that negative energy you're putting into complaining. He said, um, and just get on with things. He said, if neither of those two work, he said, you can obviously vote with your feet and leave. Or he said, you could go and set something up yourself and follow your own idea or whatever. And he said, but the one thing that is really not good, he said, is to come home here every evening complaining to me about it. He said, that is not an option. You have to move off that. Okay. So, yeah, out of that then, um, I started to think about it and, and decided that I would set up and specialise in the tech sector. What was unique about the tech sector in terms of recruitment? And um, was there a meritocracy lacking well, in that? Or? What, what I re well, first of all, I just liked, you know, I enjoyed talking to technology yeah. people. I was interested in the sector, interested in what they were doing. Um, I also found, yeah, that, that um, you know, technology, the technology sector was very much meritocracy. It was, you know, if you were good at what you did, it didn't matter, you know, what school you went to, where you were from, you know, anything. It was really about your skill set. Um, and and I really enjoyed that. And, and the result of that, though, was that, you know, a lot of technology people were quite, I suppose, quietly confident. The good ones were really quietly confident in their own ability mm. and just very enjoyable to talk to and, and connect with. OK. So the next step then was setting up your own division yeah. within the company or no, breaking? No, no, no. Okay. I, uh, set up on my own. Set up on your own. Um, uh, but I was ba so I had made the decision to set up on my own, and you know I had just kind of sketched out what I'd need. I didn't have any finance or anything like that. So um, I was trying to figure out how we were going to manage that. Yeah. And um, a friend of mine, her husband, uh, said he would back me. Great. And he was already working in recruitment. He specialised in the whole area of accounting and finance. And he said, "Look, I'll back you." Brilliant. And that's really how it got started. Super. Okay, so then the dot com crisis came along not too long after that. No, that was so that was eighty nine ninety. Okay. Now it was a tough time to okay, set up yeah, a business. I mean, it was you know we were very much in recession, and it was a difficult time. And I mean, it, you know, it, I was interviewing so many people who were really finding it hard to get jobs. That whole first wave of industry had started to pull out okay. of Ireland, you know, so we were at that stage where there was a lot of uh, assembly type plants, a lot of that manufacturing type business. And a lot of those at the end of the 80s were, were pulling out. And the whole the new wave of industry hadn't quite started to come in from an FDI point of view. So it was quite a difficult time. But, but the tech sector was starting to grow. And um, 
I suppose we, we then started to grow with that. And in 1994, then I bought out the chap who backed me and um, then continued to grow the business. And then in 1999, we did an IPO. And that was the whole, you know, that was in the lead up to the whole dot com thing. And it was just like, it was fantastic. <laughs> there was people who were hiring, you know, they couldn't get enough technology people. We were specialists in tech. It was the place to be. I want you the first female CEO, Irish CEO, who went public. That's right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but then, of course, what happened was that was all wonderful. And then in 2001, you know, the whole, you know, the whole tech sector, uh, the whole dot com thing was just. Um, just collapsed. Just collapsed, yeah. Yeah. So how did you cope with that? What sort of strategies did you employ to survive? Um, so, well, we really, I suppose one of the things that stood to us was, and, and you know, recruitment is a bit like this, you see things a little bit ahead of the market. So despite the fact that everybody was talking about how brilliant everything was and how buoyant it was and Y2K had come and gone and the world hadn't collapsed, but actually we started to see very quickly, we started to see that things were starting to slow. So we managed our cost base very well. Um, and um, then we decided that we obviously we were overly dependent on one sector and we largely were a permanent placement. So we placed people largely in permanent jobs. So I suppose we had dual strategy, one that we were, want to maintain that specialist ethos because I was very committed uh, and still am to the view that you need to have a deep knowledge of the sector in which you're operating in order to be able to really advise people in terms of their careers. And so we wanted to maintain that specialist ethos, um, but at the same time we needed to broaden the risk from being just totally dependent on one sector. And at that stage we started to build a number of specialist businesses in each sector and we also made some acquisitions. What, what verticals did you concentrate so on? So healthcare, so um, uh, technology, healthcare, uh, pharma, uh, uh, engineering, uh, finance that would be our big sectors. Okay. Professional um, sectors, yeah. 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 Now we also okay. have business in like industrial as well, uh, um, but there are our three biggest sectors are tech still um, healthcare and pharma. So you persevered through some really tough times there. Cause I know there's a number of people in the audience here on the New Frontiers program, quite yeah. new to the whole startup entrepreneur situation. So it's, it's, it's interesting for them, instructive, I think, to hear that it's tough. Oh, it is tough. You know, I mean, and it's a total commitment. Yeah. You know, it really is. And like nobody sets up and starts a business without kind of going through um, tough times in the cycle. And I think you've just got to dig deep. And, and get on with it. So at some stage then in the, was it 2006, 2007, you went for the Ernst & Young so Entrepreneur of the Year? 2006. Yeah, 2006. <coughs> that must so have been an amazing experience. It was phenomenal. Yeah, it was really fantastic. And um, the Entrepreneur of the Year program, the UI Entrepreneur of the Year program is interesting in that, you know, before I went into the program, I didn't really know too much about what, it's, what it was about. And it's hard to understand what the experience is. Um, but what that did was it opened me up to a phenomenal network of um, successful entrepreneurs, really, who built their businesses. Huge learning opportunity, like just incredible, and um, and really enjoyable, great fun. So I, I know um, one limited company, at least um, Terry Fox of um, Copprint, Cop was involved. Yeah. Was that this? That was so, more uh, recent Terry times, wasn't it? Terry won his category in. Uh, 2014, um, Cuprint, um, the business he set up, fantastic, like set it up in the recession in 2009. You just, you know, it's not the kind of business you'd imagine you'd set up in a recession. He saw this gap in the market um, for uh, coffee cups, essentially, and you know, water cups and all that. Um, and these were being manufactured, I suppose, in, in huge big orders um, for big multiples. And he spotted a gap to do them in much smaller um, orders, but also to really tailor them and brand them in ways that businesses would want. And he's just built, I mean, he employs probably about 70, 80 people, his businesses all over Europe now. Um, 
just a fantastic success story. And I guess the great thing about the program is it, it, it sort of highlights you. It's great for your um, promoting you without paying for the PR. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you get you know great brand recognition, brand recognition for your business, but also for your team because, you know, it's really your team who built the success of the business. And to see to see your team recognized like that, I think is fantastic. That's the real, and, and, and they get such a lot of it. And your customers as well, um, I think, your customers as well think, take a certain pride in that. Of course, too. yeah. Excellence right. in your field, it yeah. shows that. And what was it like then going internationally and competing for Ireland? Mm -hmm. Um, where was the where was the final on that year? The world stage then is a whole other, um, the, you know, that's a whole other dimension altogether. So the finals then take place in Monte Carlo, and uh, I have to say, you know, it's you're just dealing with world class companies. The winners are, you know, they're just incredible companies, and um, on a huge scale. Um, pro I think usually about 50 or 60 different com countries represented. So of course this year the Collison brothers from Limerick were in the finals mm -hmm. with a Stripe and they're two incredible entrepreneurs really um, to have built their business to what it is in sh such a short space of time. But also I think their story is so unique because <laughs> this, was, this is their second business. They'd already had an exit I think when they were doing their leaving cert or something. <laughs> from their first business so mm. like really uh, outstanding stories so it must be really sort of insightful having been a winner and now being on the other side of the table and being a, chairing the judging panel what sort of qualities do you see common in, in successful entrepreneurs or what qualities are you guys looking for in the winning teams and, and individuals well, i would say the kind of qualities that i see in successful entrepreneurs generally they're pretty they're fairly positive people uh, they're very action oriented. It's all about can you know they're very can do, um, resilient. I think the key trait um, uh, of a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, they tend to be good you know good leaders, um, creative, looking for solutions all the time. And uh, they're the kind of traits I'd see. Um, in terms of what the there's twelve on the judging panel of uh, um, uh, the EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, all the judges are from pretty diverse backgrounds um, and really what we're looking for um, is to look at how the entrepreneur has built and shaped their business. What was the problem they were trying to solve? Uh, looking at uh, the innovation. Um, now depending on the category, the, the, um, there's emerging industry and international. Um, in the industry and international category you would expect them to have good financial strength. Um, in the emerging category, you're probably veering more to towards the, the innovation piece. And um, is the emerging more for startups? The emerging is very much around the startup right. scene. Um, and uh, yeah, no, some like, I mean, you would be so encouraged about the startup scene in Ireland, and indeed about entrepreneurship in Ireland, when you just see the caliber of some of those companies coming through and and the diversity of the companies, and also too. Um, I think most entrepreneurs now are looking at a global, you know, from from start out, they're looking at a global um, reach and a global customer base. They're not just thinking about Ireland as our market. And I suppose that's one of the, the very noticeable changes I would have seen over the last maybe seven or eight years. What do you think about the whole funding, sort of uh, funding versus bootstrapping argument with startups? What's your, <coughs> what's your take on that? Because sometimes people say that there's a, there's a sort of a culture uh, coming out now of just chasing sort of grant after grant and funding and, and losing sort of focus on the product and um, that a lot of people would say bootstrapping is a better route. route. Yes, <coughs> I think, look, it depends on the, your circumstances really and I suppose it depends on how quickly you can get to a revenue generating model to, you know, as to whether you're able to bootstrap or not. Um, I would think for startups though focus is very important and, and, and I think if you have a clear focus on, your co on the customer on what's the solution you're trying to solve, um, who's going to buy the product, who's going to buy the product or service from you. Um, I think in general funding will come to the really good ideas, you know, and most funders whether they're VCs or um, they're, you know, they want to be in with, with the best ideas and the best uh, startups. So I think that will come. 
I think it, you can get very distracted raising small amounts of money all along the way. Um, so that's where I think the focus is important to, to really say, make sure you raise enough when you're raising it. And you do a little bit of angel investing yourself, I believe, bit, which yeah. must be interesting. It is interesting, yeah. Because I, I guess the, the difference between angel and, and VCs is that you're sort of giving them a little bit of mentorship and you have a bit more of an interest than just a financial one. That's right. Which is, which is, which is nice for the startups. Yeah. Yes. No, it is. It's very interesting. And, and I, I love that startup feeling. There's something really great about being involved. It's the passion, the enthusiasm, um, the belief, and um, you know, the whole the team effort, I think, around a startup. Like you just focus on, on you know, where you want to be. And uh, I think that's really exciting. You must get approached by a lot of startups. What sort of criteria do you start to follow in terms of who you're interested in? backing? I think at the very early startup stage for me it's all about the individual. It's you know it's about who that who that leader or driver or founder of the business is. Um, uh, I think that's really the key. You know there are so many wonderful ideas out there like really good ideas but I wouldn't have the expertise across that you know any all those sectors or whatever so I very much go on the individual and you know obviously the idea and the solution but mostly the individual. individual. Just going back to CPL, um, your industry is really changing at the moment isn't it like, yeah. like most. What do you see the future of work looking like? Yeah it's very, I just think we're at a very interesting time in our history. Um, I think you know the pervasiveness of technology now and the changes that are coming in the workplace are really fascinating. Um, you know, if you think that we're really starting to see um, machine learning and artificial intelligence and the whole robotics and all this really start to come to life. Um, a friend of mine was in China um, a couple of weeks ago and she um, went into reception in this building and the receptionist was a robot. Really? Yeah. She, like, in, you know, you kind of hear about it, yeah, but yeah. you don't expect it to happen. No. I said, well, you know, what did she or he do? And she said, well, she said it was really interesting because, you know, quite kind of lifelike. And, um, but, uh, you know, feel stupid huge, talking to yeah, it. Huge big building, but, but also, you know, the, so basically what, it, what the robot did was direct you to the room you were going to. Just said, well, you're in, or oh, you're whatever name, and you're in room, whatever. Wow. You know, stands on the fifth floor, press that button on the, you know, whatever way it was. And so, okay, while it's still, you know, it's still such early days in these things, you know, in the next couple of years, that's, some of this stuff will become real. And, you know, um, the likes of Oxford Research and these places are, are putting out some really phenomenal statistics about how, um, how people will interface with organizations in terms of how little actual face-to-face -face, um, uh, connection there will be. Uh, and how much of those processes can be automated. And I think what's interesting is now that, you know, in the past, you know, in the Industrial Revolution and at other times, it tended to be the lower level jobs that were taken out um, and then new jobs created um, with different skill sets. But, you know, it would seem now that we have algorithms reading legal papers and the whole kind of finance accounting area and this blockchain technology and all this. So I think it'll be fascinating. But what I do think is that the thing that may become most important in all of this is actually our humanness. Or, you know, that, those human qualities that we have, that ability to connect, to um, build empathy. You know, I don't, I think they're the ones that will be really important. So you're saying, you know, traditional qualifications may be not quite as important as sort of an agility in your career to duck and dive? Um, okay. I think, uh, I think, I mean, I would be the first to say qualifications are really important. Okay. And, you know, I've been um, told off there, haven't constantly I? learn. <laughs> yeah, we have to all be constantly learning. So that ability to learn, actually, I think is probably the most important okay. quality um, for all of us. But um, uh, I think that ability to learn. But I think it's more about, um, I think for 
the next generation coming through, they are so smart and so adept with technology. Um, what I see sometimes is they do lack the experience in terms of face-to-face of -face connection. They're so used to the quick response, doing it on email, yeah. or, or sorry, not even email, text, um, and all that. I, and you'll hear, you'd, you'd hear the university lecturers talking about this quite a lot, um, even in some of the uh, business classes and that, where they're trying to get them into the whole area of influencing and negotiation and so on, that, you know, that's, they're the skill sets. That, mm, they need mm. to build those along with their technical skill mm. set. I don't think you can ever, say, you know, one of the things I would think that's, that's always really important is to build your technical expertise in whatever the sector or area it is that you want to work in. Okay. So just going to the whole diversity thing, did you ever find it a, a negative being a female in, a, in, in technology? Um, the whole STEM area, obviously, there should be a lot more women represented, but as a woman in business in Ireland, has it been a disadvantage in any way or an advantage or how have you found it? Um, I, well, I think first of all, when mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit different when you run your own business than, than maybe when you're in the big corporate world. Um, so I can, I can honestly say um, I've never seen it as a disadvantage um, and I suppose I'd be positive by nature anyway and I'd see lots of opportunities. Um, however, you know, through my role and my job, um, I do think at a corporate level we have a long way to go yet um, before we have you know, true equality in the workplace. But that would be similar with Silicon Valley even, wouldn't it? It's not like we're behind other parts of the world. It's like a global thing, isn't it? Um, it is a global thing, yes. Uh, yeah, it is a global thing. And um, some countries are better than others. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think, I mean, I, I must say I'd be quite passionate about the whole idea. And I know, Gronje, uh, there you are too, about um, um, girls getting, you know, in, coming into the te technology sector mm. and the whole... Um, STEM. It is very interesting though that, you know, if you look at even in Ireland coming through it, leaving Cert Level and right into university, um, girls are performing very well in terms of their grades and results. And actually when they enter the workforce, I think there's total, pretty much total equality when they enter the workforce. I think it's as you go through um, that we start to see a fall off. Mm -hmm. What about white life work balance? Are we getting any better at that? or? or people busier now with their work and not achieving a balance? Um, I think work-life balance is good because it helps you maintain perspective. I certainly say that if you run your own business, there's no such thing. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's a total commitment. And, um, but I, yeah, I do think we're better. I mean, and I think that's one of the th ways that technology actually has been great. It has given us um, good flexibility in terms of the workforce so you know the ability so many people now will work from home on days when they have you know depending on what they need to do um, and i suppose technology really frees you from being stuck in that single space and that works for employers as well as for the individual and i think that's really good um with the election in england today where they're deciding whether they'll stay or leave the european union obviously that could have big, <coughs> big implications to a small country like ireland so dependent trading with england what do you think, if the worst thing happens, which we hope doesn't, and they do leave the, the European Union, have you got a plan B for your, your company? Will it affect you badly? Well, I, you know, I, I honestly think it's hard to say, it's hard to tell um, how, if, if, if Britain were to leave, and I have to say I'm hopeful that they're going to remain. Um, I think it, it's hard to know, you know, what the longer term implications are. There's no doubt, though, that in the short term, uh, things would be very volatile. So we have a business in the UK, we have um, a pharma and healthcare recruitment business in the UK, we have about 120 people employed over there. Um, so obviously the currency volatility, you know, would, would be one thing that we would be concerned about. I'd be very concerned here, I suppose, for both our exporters and obviously, you know, we still import quite a lot from the UK, so also to the, that the impact that would have, the cost impact that that would have on us as well. Um, and I just think Britain has been a great ally to Ireland and Europe. And I think, you know, our workforces are more flexible. Um, I think there's a lot of, there's so much positives about the UK remaining um, that I really hope 
they're going to stay. So we'll see all of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just finally, Anne, before we put the, the Q and A's to the, to the audience, um, would, could you give th your top three tips for early stage startups? From your looking back over your career so far, um, what would be the three things that you would say to to a startup? Um, I would say make friends with fear, <laughs> um, and don't be at all don't be afraid of failure. You know, make decisions. Don't be afraid of some, that something's not going to work out. Make the decision um, and move on because you can change it if it doesn't work out. Um, so, so be decisive. Um, I would say let your passion drive you. You know, you need, don't listen to anybody who says it can't be done or it won't work or anything like that. Just, you know, go with what you really believe in and, and let that passion take you along. Um, I would also say that it's, you know, build your network. It's, and I know you were talking about that earlier, Pat, um, but I am a great believer in the power of network and particularly the power of connections. Um, you know, get some good mentors, get good advice, um, ask people for support. People really want to help. And I think if I had had some of the mentors earlier in my career than I had, that I've had in more recent years, I think I'd have scaled earlier right. and quicker. Yeah. Um, so I just think that those, I think it's all about relationships actually. I think really um, our success, whether it's in business or in life, is all about relationships and the quality of those relationships that you have. Wise words, great. Listen, thank you very much for sharing those wonderful insights with us, Anne. Mm -hmm.